Mes, o Thios, o Patir, o Pandukrator, Panageia Trias, eleisoni mes, o Pshaisif Notin Teni Gom, Shopi Nimen, je emon Antonin, o Vo Ithos, genen Nethlepsis, tem nen hoke givel eruk, o Lord mix worthy to pray thankfully, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, in Christ Jesus our Lord, for then is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. I was asked to speak to you about the nature of Christ. First, I like to explain to you our belief in the nature of Christ as it is revealed to us in the Holy Scripture. As you know, when we speak about theology, we don't make theories or we don't make a speculation. But what is revealed to us in the scripture, this is what we believe in. So our faith based on the revelation. For example, when the Lord Jesus Christ asked the disciples, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? And Peter told him, you are Christ, the son of the living God. The Lord told him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh 
and blood did not reveal this to you. Flesh and blood, blood means human being. So it is not a human revelation. But my heavenly father, this revelation is from the father, from God. So theology is done by revelation. What's revealed to us in the scripture and what's explained to us by early church fathers, is this what we believe in? So the Lord Jesus Christ is God the Son who was born from the Father before all ages. He is the hypostasis of the Son and he is true God of true God, as we say in the creed. And in the fullness of time, the hypostasis of the Son took full humanity for Saint, from St. Mary. Took full humanity from St. Mary. What do I mean by full humanity? Body, soul, and spirit. As each human being are composed of body, human, and spirit. So he took full humanity. The divinity did not unite with a person, but the divinity took the full humanity from St. Mary. Let me explain the difference. St. Mary did not conceive in a person. And then later on, the divinity came and dwelt in this person. No. By the way, this is heresy, the heresy of Nestorius, that St. Mary conceived a person, Jesus, and then the divinity is united with the person. But this is a heresy. But the divinity, because when, if we believe in this, then Jesus is a man who became God. And this is a heresy. Jesus is not a man who became God, but he is God who became man. Big difference between the two. Danny, the Lord Jesus Christ is not a man who became God, but he is God who became man. But he took the full humanity from St. Mary. Because another person called Apollinarius, he said he took only from St. Mary the body. And the divinity replaced the soul and the spirit of uh, the person Jesus Christ. But no, this again a heresy. Because in this way, Jesus did not become a man. He just took body. He is not a full human being. So, the Lord Jesus Christ is perfect divine and perfect human. Perfect divine and perfect human. But at the moment of conception, at the moment of conception, the divinity is united with the humanity. The divinity is united with the humanity at the moment of the conception. And since that moment, until the end of the ages, there is no separation between the humanity and the divinity, even not for a twinkling of an eye. There is no separation between the humanity and the divinity. Usually, sometimes when we try to ex explain a mystery, mystery means something above and beyond our comprehension. When we try actually to explain a, a mystery, how we explain it, there is no words to explain it 
That's why we start to say, he is not like this. He is not like this. He is not like this. Because there is no word to explain who he is. For example, usually when we speak about God, we say, without beginning, without end, timeless, with incomprehensible. So when we say he is not this, he is not this, because there is no word to explain. So when we explain the unity, if you want to ask me, can you explain the unity between the divinity and the humanity? I will tell you it is mystery. But I can tell you it is not like what? It is not like, okay, if you have solid material and solid material and you put them together, for example, if you have salt and sugar and you, you put them together, we call it mingling. They mingle together. بالعربي اختلاط اختلاط So we say this unity is not, ha- is not like how the solid material are mingled, mingled together. Okay. What about the liquid? The liquid, for example, tea and milk. When actually you mix them together, so they, they are confused together. And after you mix the, the, the tea and the milk, you cannot separate them from each other. In, in, in Arabic, we call it mazig or mtizag. You know? In English, we call it confusion because they are confused together. Now you cannot separate them. There a third type of union. We have the, the, the first type of the solid material, second type of the liquid, third type, chemicals. Chemicals, if you put hydrogen and oxygen, you will have what? Water. H2O. So here in this union, there is alteration. Because water is different from the hydrogen and different from the oxygen. That's why when we speak about this unity, we say without mingling, without confusion, and without alteration. In Arabic, بدون اختلاط ولا امتزاج ولا تغيير. Because the mingling is the union of the solid material. Confusion is the union of the liquid material, of the fluids. And alteration is the union of the chemicals. So when we say without mingling, without confusion, and without alteration, now we understand why the church used these three expression to tell us it is a mystery, incomprehensible, above and beyond our understanding. It is not like when you put solid material together or when you put flows together or even chemicals. It is a perfect union. It is hypothetical union. It is essential union. That's why when St. Paul spoke about it, he said, great is the mystery of godliness. God appeared in the flesh. It's great. Nobody can understand. And as I said, this union is permanent union. Permanent union. And during the moment of the union between the humanity and the divinity, during this moment, 
the humanity that the Lord Jesus Christ took from St. Mary because of this union at this moment it became perfect humanity perfect without sin without corruption that's why the Lord Jesus Christ was born without the original sin and his nature was not a corrupted nature And he is immortal. As we say, holy God, holy mighty, holy immortal, who was born of the virgin. And when you ask me about if he is immortal, how he died on the cross, because he accepted death, he allowed the death to approach him by his own, by his own will and authority alone. As we say in the Divine Liturgy, in St. Gregory Liturgy, in the night in which he delivered up himself to death by his own will and authority alone. And this is what he said to Pontius Pilate, I have authority to lay it down and to take it back, to lay my soul down and to take it back. So, when we speak about the Immaculate Conception, Immaculate Conception does not apply to St. Mary. But if this term we want to apply it, it applies to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because Immaculate means without sin. So the Lord Jesus Christ was conceived without sin without corruption and since this union happened we cannot speak about two natures anymore but we speak about one nature from two natures one nature from two natures And when we speak about the Lord Jesus walked on the water, I cannot, see, I cannot say his divinity. No. It is the incarnated Son of God walked on the water. When the Lord Jesus Christ was hungry after he fasted for 40 days, then the incarnated Son of God was hungry. St. Cyril, he used a term very important called exchange of properties. What do you mean by exchange of properties? Whatever is said about the humanity, we can say it about the incarnated Son of God. And whatever says about the divinity, you know, it can, say, it can be said about the Lord Jesus Christ. Because this two natures now became one nature. And from the time of the union, I cannot speak, oh, this is done by the divinity. This is done by the humanity. We cannot. Maybe some of you will ask, what happened in... Uh, in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Did the divinity part it from the humanity? You know, think about, you know, something like this pen. If it is possible to put this in fire without being melted. So the whole pen now is united with fire. Right? Then, if I separate this pen into two parts, this part will be united with fire, and this part will be united with fire. 
So that's what happened at the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. What happened? His soul, his soul was separated from his body. But the soul is still united with the divinity. And the body is still united with the divinity. And the soul that is united with the divinity descended to Hades and restored our father Adam and his children to paradise. And his body that was in the tomb is still united with the divinity. Until the day of resurrection, what happened? The human soul that is united with the divinity returned back to the body that was in the tomb and is united also with the divinity. And Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Okay. So what was separated from each other in the death of our Lord Jesus Christ? Not his divinity and humanity, no. But his human soul was separated from his body. But the human soul is still united with the divinity, and the body is still united with the divinity. Until uh, Saint Cyril used a very important term when he said, Mea thesis to eu to theo Caesar cumini. Mea means one, one from two. Thesis, like physics, nature. To eu to theo, eu theo, you hear it in the divine liturgy, eu theos, son of God. Caesar cumini sarex, the incarnated son of God. And this term was very important term. In 1989 and in 1991, when there was a dialogue between the Oriental Orthodox Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church, what solved you know, the problem of the nature of Christ, this sentence, mea thesis to you to theos arcomini, it's Greek. Because both churches, agreed on this statement that Jesus Christ has one nature from two natures. Unfortunately, in many books, especially Western books, they call us monophysite. Monophysite. The difference between monophysite and meophysite is a big difference. Because mono means a single, single nature. It is either the humanity or the divinity. But uh, meophysite means one nature, not single nature, one from two natures. The monophysite was a heresy by Eutychus, who said that in the union, the humanity completely disappeared, dissolved, disappeared in the divinity. So the Lord Jesus Christ, just a divine nature, but appeared as a human being. And this actually is a heresy the church rejected. And the monophysite, the other extreme, then it is only a human being, the, the, the humanity, like Nestorius. And the divinity just dwelled in him, not united with him. And Nestorius actually emphasized that the divinity dwelled in Jesus Christ, in the person of Jesus Christ, not united. That's why in the statement that both families, the Oriental and Eastern Orthodox Church, agreed on it, they said, 
we believe that Jesus Christ is perfect human and perfect uh, divine. And these two natures are united together without mingling, without confusion, and without alteration. And we excommunicate the heresy, the heresy of Eutychus and the heresy of Nestorius. Because this heresy and his, this heresy speak about one nature, either the divinity and the humanity disappeared like Eutychus, or it is the humanity and just the divinity dwelled, but there was no union in it. Uh, so I want you to know the difference between Miaphysite and Monophysite. The Eastern family, they call themselves Diophysite. Diophysite. Dio, they emphasize the two natures. They emphasize the two natures. And one of the big differences, we say Jesus is one nature from two natures, and they say he is one nature in two natures. Big difference between saying one nature from two natures or saying one nature in two natures. This big difference between the Eastern Orthodox and the Oriental. We say one nature from two natures. From two natures. Uh, Why we reject the two natures? Because the two natures means there is separation. And it is like one person has two natures next to each other, like this. So you speak about one, one person, but two natures. The cross, actually, in order for God the son, to die for the whole world and this sacrifice of the cross to be unlimited, to cover all sins for all the people in all ages, in order for this to happen, the divinity must be united with the humanity. Because the humanity is limited. Even the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ. But what gives the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ unlimited effect, the union with the divinity. So in order to say that the salvation of the cross covered all people in all ages, this union must be a real union. Otherwise, the the, the salvation, just who died on the cross, is one person, and he cannot redeem the whole world. That's why the church rejected the idea of the two natures, and this was the reason in the Council of Chalcedon why we don't agree on the Tom of Leo. Because if you read the Tom of Leo, it explicitly speaks about two natures. And by the way, the disagreement in the Council of, of Chalcedon is not political disagreement. It is theological. Yes, there are some political dimensions. I cannot deny this. But the separation in this council, year 451, is not mainly because of the political issues that happened. But it is a theological difference. It is a theory. Because some people who want just to promote the union, they try to say, no, 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 Council of Chelsea, there is no theological uh, differences. It is just uh, misunderstanding and political. No, it is not. And when you read the documentation of the Council of Nicaea, you can know for sure it is not uh, uh, just a political, it is theological. And one of the best books that I encourage you to read is a book written by Reverend Father Shnuda Maher about the Council of Chalcedon, in which actually he
he put many of the documents of this council that make it very clear that the, the, the difference or the split is because of theological reasons. Nestorius refused to call Saint Mary the mother of God because he said Saint Mary gave birth to a person and then the divinity dwelled in this person. He said she is a mother of Christ, not mother of God. But we believe that at the moment of the conception, the divinity is united with the humanity, then the Holy One, as Archangel Gabriel said to St. Mary, the Holy One who is, will be born of you is called the Son of God. And the word the Holy One is reserved only for God. And St. Elizabeth, after she being filled with the Holy Spirit, as we read in Luke chapter 1, she said to St. Mary, how come that the mother of my Lord comes to me? And these are not words of Elizabeth, but the word of the Holy Spirit, because she was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she called the St. Mary mother of the Lord, mother of God the word Theotokos. And St. Cyril of Alexandria gives the example how iron and fire can be united together. Because one of the questions during the cross, did the divinity suffer? So St. Cyril said, if you have a piece of iron and united with the fire, it is a real union here. But if you hit this piece of iron, all the hitting will fall on what? On the iron, although it is united with the fire. So on the cross, all the pain and suffering fell on the humanity that is united with the divinity. So there is no separation. But the divinity doesn't die, the divinity doesn't suffer. Uh, And that's, that's why when we speak about anything done by the Lord Jesus Christ, it is done by the one nature from two natures. When he converted, changed or transformed water into wine, that is the incarnated Son of God. When he died on the cross, that is the incarnated Son of God. And as I told you, it is a revelation. And let me share with you some verses from the scripture to say that the one who is born from St. Mary is God. In Luke chapter 1, 35, Archangel Gabriel said to St. Mary, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. That's very clear. And Elizabeth, in, in verse, the same chapter, verse 43, by why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? In Matthew chapter 1 and verse 23, Matthew 1 and verse 23, Behold, the virgin shall be with a child and bear a son, and, there shall, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. So she gave birth to God, son of God, mother of God. And one actually of the very, very important verses in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6 in the Old Testament. Isaiah 9, verse 6. 
For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God. Notice here the word God, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So, he is, he is the incarnated Son of God. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 40. Galatians 4 and verse 40. Sorry. Uh, Galatians 4, verse 4. There is no 4. <laughs> Galatians 4, 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman under the law. So all these verses actually speaks about the, uh, the one who is born from St. Mary is the son of God. Uh, and St. Paul, when actually he spoke about the death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 8, 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 8, which none of the rulers of this age knew about this wisdom of God, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So who died here on the cross? The incarnated Son of God. He did not uh, crucify the man Jesus Christ. But he said, the Lord of glory. The Lord of glory. Because the death of the humanity only cannot save the whole world, cannot redeem the whole world. But the humanity must be united with the divinity. So the, the death of the, of the humanity will be actually can save and redeem the whole world. St. Peter in Acts chapter 3, verse 14 and 15, he said, But you denied the Holy One. Who is the Holy One? God. And the just. And asked for a murderer, Barabbas, to be granted to you. And killed the Prince of Life. Who is the Prince of Life? God. So, can anybody kill God? But why he said, and killed the Prince of Life? Again, because he who died, who he died on the cross, it's not the person Jesus Christ. It is Jesus Christ in which, in whom actually, the divinity is united with the humanity. You killed the prince of life, whom God the Father raised from the dead, of which you are witnesses. Uh, Also, inclusion chapter 1, verse 16. Inclusions 1 and 16. He's speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ. As, as we read, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. The firstborn means the source, the origin of all creation. Does it mean he is created? For by him... By him, all things were created. By him, all things were created. By whom? By Jesus Christ. Then he is God that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominion. Then he is the creator of the angels and the archangels. All things were created through him and for him. So 
created by him, through him, and for him. Created by him, through him, and for him. Uh. What about many times the Lord spoke about or described himself as the son of man? Son of man. You know, the gospel of Matthew speaks about Jesus, the son of man. Because he wants to prove to the Jews that Jesus is the Messiah. That's why this expression, son of man, is repeated several times in the gospel of Matthew. But the Gospel of John spoke about the divinity of Jesus Christ. That's why it started by, and the Logos is God, and the Word is God. But does the word the Son of Man means is there is separation between the divinity and the humanity? Let us read John chapter 3 and verse 13 when the Lord Jesus Christ spoke with Nicodemus. He told him, No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man who is in heaven. Can you say this word about it? a regular human being? Elijah, he ascended. Can we say this word about Elijah? That Elijah ascended to heaven, Elijah came down from heaven, Elijah is in heaven? Can we say this? No. Who is the one who came from heaven? Only the Lord Jesus Christ. Who is the one while he was in earth he is in heaven. Only the Lord Jesus Christ, by his divinity, because his divinity fills all places. And who is the one who ascended to the heaven of heaven? Jesus Christ. But here the Lord used the Son of Man. So this proves that the Son of Man is God. And this is impossible to be said about Jesus unless his humanity and divinity are one. If there is two natures separated in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, this verse cannot apply to him. Because the Son of Man cannot be in heaven. And the Son of Man did not come from heaven. If the, the, nature, the two natures are separated, but to say came from heaven, ascended to heaven, is in heaven, this verse is only possible if we believe in the unity or the union of Christ, the unity between the humanity and the divinity. Also, who has authority? To forgive sin. Who can forgive sin except God alone? No one can forgive sin. And even in the sacrament of confession, Abuna does not forgive sin. Abuna just uh, proclaim the forgiveness of sin that's granted to you from God by the Holy Spirit. That's why in, in the confession that Sorry, in the absolution that we pray after the fraction, it is inaudible absolution. Abuna says, let your servant be forgiven by your Holy Spirit from my mouth. 
ليكن عبيدك محللين بروحك القدوس من فمي means what means we are forgiven by the holy spirit but this forgiveness is proclaimed is announced by the mouth of the priest so no one actually can forgive sins except god let's read matthew chapter 9 verse 6 but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Again, if the, uni- if the divinity is not united with the humanity, we cannot say this verse. If Son of Man is, is the, the, the humanity, and then the divinity is dwelling in him or coexist with him, because the, the two natures mean that the two natures coexist with e- next to each other in one person. Then the Son of Man cannot forgive sins. But that the Lord Jesus Christ said, but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. This means that the two natures are one nature. One nature. Also, who is the judge of the world? God. No one can judge the whole world except God. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 27. For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each one according to his works. If the, if the two natures are coexisting next to each other, we cannot say this verse. But who will judge the world? It is God who became man, the incarnated Son of God the Son of Man, who is also God. How? Because the two natures are united together. And there are many, many verses, actually, uh, this enough, because one last point I like to speak with you is about the two well, the well. Some people confuse the will of the, the Trinity and the will of the Lord Jesus Christ. For example, when the Lord say, said in Gethsemane, not according to my will, but according to your will, here not that the humanity is speaking to the divinity. But here the Son is speaking to the Father. Don't confuse this. When the Lord Jesus Christ in Gethsemane said, it is not my will, but your will, the Son is speaking to the Father. And this doesn't mean there is contradiction between the will of the Son and the will of the Father. But means there is total submission for, yeah, as, as St. Paul said, he obeyed unto death, the, the death of the cross. So the son here is submitting his will completely to the will of the father. Like a father and son walking together. And the son, the father asks the son, where do you like to take dinner tonight? So the son says to, to the father, whatever you desire. So here he submitted his will to, totally to the will of the father. Because many people, they think in this verse, the humanity is speaking to the divinity. No. It is the Son is speaking to the Father. Okay. As I told you, Jesus is a perfect man and a perfect divine. So, the Son of God, since eternity, has a will. Definitely there is a will for the, the hypostasis of the Son. And since the son of uh, the, the, the humanity is perfect, 
then there is a well here. So after union, can we speak about two wells, the human well and the divine well? Or they are united together? Again, from the moment of the union, not only the two natures are united to one nature, but there is no two wells in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is only one well, the well of the incarnated Son of God. That's why we believe that he, he has one will and one action. What do you mean one action? There is no action done by the humanity and action done by the divinity. No. Any action is done by the incarnated Son of God. And the will is the will of the incarnated Son of God. That's why we don't speak about Two wills after union. Uh, so don't confuse the will of the Father and, and the will of the Son, because sometimes there are some verses speaking about the will of the Father and the will of the Son. So don't confuse these two wills with the will of uh, of of the humanity and divinity. And the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, their, their will are in agreement together. There is no contradiction. For example, in John chapter 5, verse 30, the Lord Jesus Christ says, I can, I can of myself do nothing as I hear I judge and my judgment is righteous because I don't seek my own will but the will of the Father who sent me. So here you can see the agreement. Another verse, John 6, 38. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Uh, another, uh, John 4, 34. John 4, 34. My food is to do the will of him, the Father, who sent me, and to finish his work. So here, since there is one well for the incarnated Son of God, we cannot speak about two actions. One action is done by the divinity, and another action is done by the humanity. No. It is one action, and... Uh, one well and one nature from two natures. This is actually a, a summary, a quick summary about the nature of Christ. If you want to read more about it, there is a very, very wonderful book called The Unity of Christ by St. Cyril of Alexandria. I encourage you to read this book. Unity of Christ by St. Cyril of Alexandria. It's easy reading book, but it is wonderful. And if you want to understand exactly what happened in the Council of Chalcedon, I, I recommend highly to read the book about the Council of Chalcedon written by uh, Reverend Father uh, Shenouda. Glory be to God forever. Amen. If you have any questions, we can... Answer this question. Ninety questions. Ninety.
I read a spiritual book written by an Abuna, and it was talking about how wearing perfume is a sin. Can you elaborate on this idea? I don't think it's a sin, uh, unless a person is very, very preoccupied with the vanity of the world. So if you are preoccupied with the vanity of the world, that's sin. But just wearing perfume is not sin in itself. How can one love God? I can be obeying and be conscious of my hierarchical position, but it does not constitute true love. So how can genuinely have love directed toward God? The Lord told us, he who loves me obey my commandment. Let me tell you something. Any virtue, any virtue can be applied on two levels. The level of the will, the mind, and the level of the heart. For example, loving God. Maybe I cannot have these emotions inside my heart toward God. But I can make a decision to love God and to obey his commandments. And when I am faithful in obeying the commandment of God, God actually will process this love from the level of the will and the mind to the level of the heart. Then I can feel this love inside my heart. Humbleness. You cannot have a switch and touch your heart to be a humble person. But you can do that by your will. You make a decision to do the exercises of humbleness, like obedience, like serving others, like taking the last seat, putting others in honor before you. And when God sees your faithfulness in these exercises, then he will change your heart. How does the church deal with domestic violence? Uh, Definitely the church is against domestic violence. And uh, the church, number one, seeks the safety of the people, the safety of the family. Uh, and uh, the, the church actually encouraged the person who is angry to get uh, courses in anger management. To, to know how to uh, control his, his anger. The rest of the question about divorce in case of domestic violence, uh, every case is different. Uh, and I want to differentiate between separation or divorce and permit for remarriage. For, for example, maybe because of the safety if there is a, a high risk on the, the family, on the members of the family, from a person who is really angry. May the, maybe the church for the safety, uh, actually, they allow separation. But for divorce and remarriage, the Bible says clearly there is no divorce except for sexual immorality. So if we want to protect the, the family from the violence, the church may agree on separation, but divorce and remarriage only allowed if there is sexual immorality. What are some reasons the church accepts to allow a divorce? Okay, there is no divorce except for uh, sexual immorality as the Lord Jesus Christ said in Matthew chapter 19. I sometimes use personal prayer time at night as a therapy session with God. Instead of standing up and praying, I sit down and talk with him as if he is my therapist. What do you think? Before whom stand the angels and the archangels and the principalities. 
And I stand before God and ask healing. He is the physician of our souls, body, and spirits. So you can talk with him as your physician. We speak to him in the litany for the sick as our physician. And who are seeking therapy. No, stand. It's, it's a sign of respect for God, yeah. Who is the sinful woman that was in the book of Luke? Some say it is sister of Lazarus. Uh, and some people say it's Mary Magdalene. And you know, there are many يعني, theories, but again, as long as it is not revealed in the scripture, خلاص, we refer to her as a sinful woman in the house of Simeon the Pharisee. Some people will be asked about second priest for churches that need second priest. Yes, God willing. Is it selfish for me to want to travel with the possibility of living in another state or country if it means leaving my parents here? Number one, do they need you or not, your parents? Number two, why, why you just you are, want to leave yani, uh, for, for work or just you want to, to, to leave your family and go to another place? And this country or this um, state doesn't have church, Coptic church, you will be close to the church. So you need to examine your motive. Are you moving for selfish reasons or you are moving because of necessity? If eternity is infinitely longer than our life on earth, how can we be motivated to care about anything earthly, like our career or business, and not only spiritual matters? Do we have an assignment by God to fulfill here on earth? Yes, we were created for purpose. God doesn't create us haphazardly, but created each one of us for a purpose, for a goal. And we need actually to be faithful. Then, do you remember what the Lord said? You were faithful on what's least, I will appoint you on what's much. So we need to be faithful here on earth, in our career, in, in business, in, definitely in, in our spiritual life. And because of this faithfulness, God actually will assign us, uh, you know, uh, in, in heaven, uh, a portion in heaven. Uh, but as the Lord said, seek first the kingdom of God, of his righteousness, and all these things will be granted to you. Uh, my brother is in high school and he is a deacon. He attends liturgy every Sunday and Sunday school and prays before he sleeps at night. The issue is he watches pornography and doing terrible things and having a very low self-esteem. I don't want to tell my parent about it and try to give him hints that what he is doing is sin, but he never listens. He's also have a father of confession and he usually confesses every two months or so, what do you advise me to do with him? You need to talk to him clearly, not just giving him hint. Uh, pornography is addictive. Maybe he wants to quit, but he doesn't know how. You know, in it changes, there are six stages of change. Unwilling, 
dreaming, willing, acting, persevering, and overcoming. So these are the six stages. We need to, to see in which stage he is. He is unwilling or he is dreaming. Dreaming means, yes, it would be nice, but I don't think it's possible. So it's just like a dream. Or he is willing or he is acting on it or persevering means he just, it's ups and down or did he overcome? Because the support that you give him in each stage is different. If he's unwilling, think how to motivate him and to, to give him hope he can overcome this addictive uh, habit. If he's dreaming again, sharing some success stories and motivation and giving him hope and trust in God, this will help him. If he is willing, you need to put an action plan with him. And one important thing in action plan is what we call uh, radical amputation. Uh, the Lord said, if your eye causes you to sin, block it out. He did not say close it. So if I want to, to quit pornography, I need to get rid of the internet completely. And if there is assignment, if there is some work I need to do it, I will do it in a public area and open space in front of everybody. But I should not have access to internet if, if I want to quit pornography. Like a person who is addicted to any drug, they put him in rehab center in which there is no access to drugs. This part of the detox uh, for the pornography. Then if he is willing, uh, sorry, if he's acting, then you need to uh, follow up with him and see what are the barriers, what, what, what are the challenges. And the, the support during this stage is very important. If he is persevering, يعني, right, ups and down, ups and down, he needs encouragement in this stage and, and to tell him, you will do it, you will overcome through the grace of God. So support during this stage until he reaches the last stage, which is overcoming through the grace of God. So just don't give him hints. Speak to him directly about it. Why does the Lord Jesus Christ use the term son of man when he referred to himself in the Bible to say he is indeed a perfect human as he is a perfect divine? And the two natures are united together. Because if he did not use this term, uh, Many people would, be, would believe in the heresy of Eutychus, that the divinity, dis, uh, sorry, the humanity dissolved completely in the, in the divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 7, verse 55, about St. Stephen, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus is standing at the right hand of God. How, the question, how and when Jesus is in God and God is in Jesus? Okay. Yes, God is in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Lord God the Father in Jesus and Jesus is in God. But Jesus when he ascended, he ascended with his glorified body. So here, St. Stephen saw the glory. God doesn't have right hand or, or left hand, by the way. So, but he saw the glory of God, like how the St. Peter and Andrew and James, uh, sorry, Peter and John and James, Peter, John, and James, on the Mount of Transfiguration, saw the glory of God. And then, in the right hand of God, so uh, the Lord Jesus Christ was seen in the glory, in the power of God. That's the right hand of God, in the power of God, or, or in, the, uh, in, in, the, in the glory of the Father. 
that what actually the, the vision he saw. And, and the vision, actually, it's just a vision. Uh, the vision is something to make us understand a message, but it doesn't reflect the reality. What do I mean by this? Like John, in book of Revelation, saw a lamb as if it is slaughtered, and he took the scroll from the hand of the Father. So, is Jesus in heaven, we'll see him as a lamb, slaughtered, but this is just a vision. So the vision that John saw, or the vision that St. Stephen saw, it is just a vision to send us a message that Jesus is glorified. Jesus is the power of God. That's what this means. I always hear when someone asks if God dies in preaching that our Lord Jesus Christ died for us on the cross. We hear the answer saying God does not die. Who died is the human being. That answer is usually said to the other people from the other background. Ask about that. But on the other side we pray in the divine liturgy saying your death, O Lord, we proclaim. I'd like to know how. Okay. Do you remember in the lecture I told you St. Cyril of Alexandria said the exchange of properties? For example, whatever we say about the divinity can be said about the Lord Jesus Christ. And whatever said about the humanity can be said about the Lord Jesus Christ. Because in him, the humanity and divinity are united. God in himself does not die. But since the divinity is united with the humanity, we can say Jesus died on the cross, the Lord died on the cross, but God died on the cross. But when we say God died on the cross, definitely we don't mean the divinity died, because the divinity doesn't die. But as St. Cyril explained, if you have a piece of iron, and this iron is heated with fire, and you hit on it, you know, then what is actually hit here, being hit here, is the iron, although it's united. If, if you bend it, what's bent here is the iron, not the fire. Okay, so what died in the cross is the humanity. But if I say is the humanity, I am now speaking about two separate natures. And I cannot speak about humanity and divinity separate. Who died on the cross, God in the flesh, the incarnated Son of God. But I understand that divinity does not die. But so, to be accurate, the humanity that is united with the divinity died on the cross. As I told you, like the soul, was separated from the body, the soul separated from the body, but the soul is the, uh, the united with the divinity and the body united with the divinity. Uh, sometimes when people from a non-Christian background, you know, they will not understand the unity of Christ. So in explanation to them, we tell them the humanity died. And we cannot say, we cannot speak about humanity not uh, united with divinity because this is the diathesis or the mysterious heresy. Just to explain, God, we don't believe that God dies. But when we use the term, your death, O Lord, yes, because that's what St. Cyril spoke, exchange of property. We can say, God was hungry after fasted 40 days. But the divinity never gets hungry. And I can say the Son of Man ascended to heaven, or the Son of Man will judge the world. 
But the Son of Man cannot ascend. The Son of Man cannot judge the world. You understand? But this is what Sam Cyril meant by the exchange of properties. Whatever we can say about the, the humanity can be said about the Lord Jesus Christ. And whatever can say about the divinity can be said about the Lord Jesus Christ because in him the two natures are united together. Does the authors of the Bible directly write the books attributed to them? Yes. Or were these texts produced by communities who heard their teaching and later compiled a book and named it after them? No, that's not right. Uh, they say, Markinian com community followed St. Mark for the Gospel of St. Mark rather than uh, solely by individual like St. Mark or prophet like Isaiah in the Old Testament. No. These, th these theories comes from the biblical criticism who want to cast doubt on the Bible and the authority of the Bible and the fallibility of the Bible and the inspiration of the Bible. No. It is written by the authors. Gospel of St. Mark written by St. Mark. Gospel of St. Luke written by St. Luke. Uh, prophecy of Isaiah written by Isaiah. I think uh, exceeded uh, 15 minutes, 20 minutes now. Okay. Glory be to God forever. Amen. Uh, we thank God that we are blessed uh, this evening with His Eminence, Metropolitan Yusuf. Uh, we are always learning from every single word of His mouth. And we are looking forward to this, that uh, this meeting will be repeated. Uh, we'll take a photo together with his eminence, and then after we pray. Amin alleluia duksabati. Trikei oke agyob nev mati kenin kai kesose on astone on. Choice of Choice of a rebon, Hanem of Tahu, Raftan, Benyot, Tayot, and our share of Sebaba, Avata, Wadros, Nembenyot, a metropolitis of a use. If not in Ted, the photogro, he shall know a throne, also an mission from Benaman, say you and Harry Nick, and Teft, the Yo and Nogajitiro, Sabi, sit and know a child of Gain Cole, Toa, Bechrestos, Eria, Guntif, Can, and Novin, and Evon, Hino, Harry, and Katab of Nest, and Nike, Kirele, son, Kirele, son, Kirie, Vlogis, on a minus, more heroes, more heroes, Timit, and Yaconi, will go and be. Christos Benoti, Amen, as a show. O King of Peace, grant us your peace, establish us your peace, forgive us our sins. For yours is the power, glory, blessing, and majesty forever. Amen. O Lord, make us worthy to pray thankfully. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Christ Jesus, our Lord, for then is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, love of God the Father, the grace of his only begotten Son, our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, communion and gift of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go in peace. May the peace of the Lord be with you all. Amen.
We have, uh, we have Urban, a blessing from uh, his eminence. And then we also have uh, food downstairs and games. So take the blessing, and then if you can head downstairs, that would be great. See you guys down.